why you do it. Thank you, everybody, for joining me. I'm here with Mitchell. We're going to answer some questions. Jump right in. All right. You want to do that? You want me to do it? I got it. All right. Hello, everybody. I hope you are all doing well. My name, as you have already figured out, is Zane, and this is Mitchell. Welcome to the live Q&A for July's Learn with the Nerds. And we are going to be answering some of your questions today. All right, I'm ready. You ready? I'm absolutely ready. And before we get started, I have to say, my barber, I'm sure you all noticed my hair was a little bit longer. My barber is fast. Five-minute haircut. It looks pretty good, too. <laughs> It, it looks, looks like a five minute haircut. <laughs> All right, so we're going to jump right into starting with some questions from the event itself, and then we'll jump into so hopefully some real time questions. We're going to talk about our next event, and then we're also going to be doing a giveaway. A giveaway. We always do the giveaway on these. Exciting. So that'll be awesome as well. So for the first question, we're going to say when we change the data type, is there any specific reason why dot D types return string Python? rather than just calling it a string? There it is. So good question. Uh, the first thing here is that when we're working with pandas, right, we have some, I guess you could say legacy type uh, data types there. Uh, and when you, you get into pandas and, and a few other coding languages, data types uh, get a little bit odd, right? And this is a good example of uh, why exactly does it say Python string? Well, pandas refers to a string as an object and it's as simple as this. You simply go uh, and change the data type to a string, and guess what happens? It just tells you that it's specifically a Python string. That's really all there is to it. There's not necessarily anything that you're going to run into as uh, an error uh, when you just leave it as an object, although I'm sure there are certain circumstances if you're writing the file to another location where you would need to make sure those data types are lining up correctly. But it's just specifically saying, hey, this is a string, uh, Python specific string. All right, that was perfect. So I have another question here. Okay. This is from a guy named uh, Mitchell Pearson asked this question. Oh, really? Yeah, that was me. Who's that? Oh, you? <laughs> yeah, okay, was, gotcha. gotcha. So uh, why would you use, we're, we're, this is Python. We're talking about Python. We're in a Jupyter note, uh, we're in the notebook, we're working with it. And you, you immediately pivoted to Pandas. Mm -hmm. So why did we use Python or, or Pandas instead of Python? Well, it's funny because whenever you're talking about wrangling your data, right, cleaning up your data, oftentimes you'll see those two words together, Python, pandas. I think the best way to explain this one is that Python is a huge coding language. Mm. Data scientists use it. Data analysts use it. Mm. Uh, you can use it for web development and tack on other libraries out there like Jinja to create a front-facing website, right? The beauty of Python, as we talked about in the beginning of the session, was that it is open source and it has a huge community. And a part of that huge community uh, is the amount of libraries that have been created to add on to the value that we actually get from Python. So to be a little bit more specific here, what we are going to see with Python is that it has its basic functionality, right? Uh, and then we're going to have other libraries out there that are going to beef it up for a very specific purpose, right? Something very, very specific like analyzing your data. So the question, why would we use pandas to analyze our data rather than just normal Python is really because that's what Panda was built for and that is something it's simply good at and actually a lot better than Python itself. All right, perfect. I was, uh, as you were answering the question, which I thought was really well done, because of your joke with the hair at the beginning, <laughs> I looked over at you and started laughing. I, mean, uh, <laughs> I heard you over there. A, a five minute haircut is pretty legit though. Okay, well I'm That's glad that it took you uh, five minutes to get the joke too, so. <laughs> All right, so uh, next question here. Presume RAM is a limiting factor with the amount of data that you can load. Also, can you use head tail when showing the data? So good question here. So. Yes, the short answer is your, your RAM, your CPU, your actual 
system is going to be the limited factor. Now, I'm going to separate this away from Jupiter Light. That's all one running in the web, uh, and, and it has some other features that are running in the background. But just to talk about how you would normally be running Python pandas on your actual system, on your machine, yes, that is going to be the limiting factor. Now, the beauty of this is that because we're running on our own system, we're going to be using up our RAM, then if we're working with very large pieces of data here, we might not be able to store all of that in memory, which is one of the items or features that makes Pandas very efficient, is storing this data inside of memory. Well, to get around this large data, you can actually read in the data in chunks. So I could say I want 10 rows out of my 100 rows in a file. Then, in some kind of function that you set up, you could perform your transformations on those 10 rows, load it to your data destination, and then continue with the next 10 and the next 10 after that. And then, of course, to finish up the last part of that question, can you use head or tail at the end of an execution of a data frame statement? Yes, you can. And for those who do not know what that is, that's basically just saying, hey, I've got this huge table or data frame, just give me the top five rows or give me the last five rows. It's not something that you should use as any kind of method of sorting your data, uh, but it's just an easy way to look at your data and explore it. All right, excellent. Next question here, and then we're going to get to the real-time questions. Using Jupyter and these cells has a learning curve, so working within right. the notebook, right? Uh, you have to shift enter the cells in sequence to get data to flow to the next step. They're asking, do you have to I think I can almost answer this one, right? Go for it, I go think for so. it. So the answer is yes. Effectively, once you run a code cell, you're taking data, you're putting it into, a, for all intents and purposes, a variable in many instances, right. and then you're using that variable in the next step, or you're importing libraries. There are literally thousands of libraries that have been built by the community, which you mentioned on your session earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the answer is yes, you have to run those code cells. Now normally we only run those code cells line by line when we're in the middle of debugging and testing the code. When you get done with that entire notebook, it's generally something, how would you handle that, right? Because right. this is just developing. So the first thing just to piggyback off of that is that number one, Python is an interpreted language, right? Python is an interpreted language. And so what that means is that we are going to be running and reading line by line. Uh, that is why it gets to the heart of all of these cells uh, being separate from one another. And you have to run one before you get to the next. And then one last thing that I do want to mention here is with Jupyter Notebooks, it is a learning curve. And the good news is there's a lot of settings after you get past that learning curve and you'll learn that you're able to do things like run all code cells from uh, above or below from the current cell that you actually have selected. All right. Let's see what we got for real time questions here. We, I know we're going to have some good ones. One is yo. Let's, and yo. We got one for That's it. usually how I start sentences. All right. Let's see. Do we data? I've, I've not curated these by the way I was looking at the chat so you're gonna just see whatever this is with me uh, do we have data model in Python for performance like we do in Power BI is the mindset wide Excel like tables or are we looking more for star schema so there's obviously a lot we can do in Python right. a lot but assuming from a uh, data cleansing and transformation perspective so I would say that number one whenever you're working with your data inside of Python your goal is to clean it, clean it up. And I'm going to compare this to Power Query, right? First things first, you open up Power BI, you read in your data, then you're going to load it into Power Query. You're going to perform your transformations. It's only then after that are you going to start modeling. And so just to compare against Power Query, Python is acting as our Power Query portion of the step. At that point, we would then be loading that data into a location. The place that we are loading the data into is going to be uh, what is going to tell us how exactly are we modeling our data. Are we going to be going for that star schema, right, so that we can go and build reports and visuals off of it? Are we going to be looking at the snowflake schema? Uh, and I would say that the same uh, ideals of data modeling in general, dimensional modeling, is going to apply here as well. So I would definitely keep that in mind for sure. All right, next question. Uh, this is from Fins and Scuba. Oh, Fins this and Scuba. was great. 
Thank you. In the notebook.zip file, or in the zip file, could we add the plot code? I'm getting an error. This might be hard to identify exactly what's going on, but could we add the plot code? I'm getting an error. It's not showing the legend, but the chart is okay. Oh, this is a great question. So the first thing I want to say is for everybody, you have a completed notebook inside of your class files. And it actually has a lot of additional explanations that I wanted to get to, but you know, we had a lot to discuss. So just know there is more content in that solution uh, notebook in the class files. And that is going to include that visual, that plot that we created as well. I don't know exactly what issue that you are encountering in this case, but here's what I'll tell you. Just as a best practice when it comes to working with matplotlib inside of a notebook. And that is going to be that you want to make sure that your logic is going to be in one code cell. The reason for this is because when we start to create a visual like this, we are going to be saving different settings and configuration according to the state of that plot. Now, I know that's a bunch of jargon, but all that really means is that the code needs to be close together for it to know what exactly you are referencing. All right, so uh, we're going to take two more questions real quick. All right. First question, I presume you can use R in Python. Would it be better to do data manipulation in R or Pandas? Would it be better to do data manipulation in R or Pandas? That is a great question. Uh, I'm not super familiar with R, mm. uh, but I will tell you one thing. Pandas is extremely efficient because it has something called parallel processing. There's a lot of fun items that go into that, vectorized operations, uh, and there's other languages that have that as well. But I would say that is something I would give the award to Python and Pandas for, is those vectorized operations and parallel processing. All right, I love the next question. This is from Colleen, and uh, this actually cues us up for something I wanted to talk about anyway. I am wondering if you have any classes on Python. So hey, this was great, know, do we? but this went quick. So what else it's, do we have, Zane? So that is a great question. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I love this Learn with the Nerds because it gave a lot of you the opportunity that don't know Python yeah. to see, hey, is Python something that I'm excited about? Is it worth the time investment? And that goes right into the classes that we do have. So we actually have a Python boot camp. It's a four day boot camp. You get to hang out with yours truly for four whole days. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing for you. That's your decision. I'll leave it up to you. Uh, and that is going to be coming on July 28th, and it'll be through the 31st. You also have a Python for the Data Analyst on-demand learning class that you can access as well on our on-demand learning platform. All right. Uh, Zane, you're going to take this next part. We're going to be doing a giveaway. They're going to I'm pop so excited. right up on the screen. I am as well. Are you ready for the giveaways? <laughs> All right, so it looks like those are our three giveaways. We've got Heather R. Congratulations, you have a new giveaway. It's a yep. license, correct? ODL license. For, ODL license. For a full year. For a full year. You, you, you don't even know what the giveaway is. <laughs> <laughs> full year to our on demand learning at Pragmatic Works, over 200 classes. It's awesome. You're going to enjoy it. Make sure you take a screenshot of this, Heather. You're going to email us at marketing at pragmaticworks.com with that screenshot to verify that it is you because this is so popular. Everybody <laughs> wants it. We're going to have some impersonation going on here. So make sure you take that screenshot. And who else do we got? So we also have Joseph, Joseph Moita. Please forgive me if I mispronounce your name. But you also have a year on demand learning subscription. And by the way, like I said, that is also going to include that Python for data analyst class. So make sure you take that. I think it's eight hours long. So a lot of content there for mm -hmm. you. And last but not least, we have Jeremy Ghibli. That's what I'm talking about. There is our next <laughs> winner for the on-demand learning license. All right. So the last thing we have is our Learn with the Nerds event for next month. It's going to be Jonathan. Jonathan. Jonathan I almost so called Jonathan Joseph. I'm sorry, Jonathan. That is going to be Jonathan Silva next month in August, creating auto autonomous agents with Copilot Studio. So make sure that you register for that. Get prepared as early as you can so you can jump in and have some fun there with Jonathan. All right. Wrap us up. 
Everyone, I really hope that you enjoyed this July Learn with the Nerds. We had a lot of fun, at least I hope that you did, talking about robots and fighting, and just make sure you don't talk about it, but that you do analyze data that deals with all of those underground robot fights. My name is Zane Goodman. This is Mitchell Pearson. We all hope that you have a wonderful rest of your July, and we will see you for the next Learn with the Nerds event. See you later.